Measurement and control of process variables play a most important part in our operations. Safety and efficiency of operations, as well as rigid product specifications, require accurate measurement and control. In segment one, you will learn about process variables and sensing devices. The range of instrument control varies widely. For example, an ethylene purification unit may operate with temperatures as low as a minus 150 degrees Fahrenheit. While the furnaces on a steam cracking unit will heat oil up to temperatures above 1400 degrees. Control of process operations requires control of the four basic process variables. Pressure, flow, temperature, and level. If we are to control process variables, we must first be able to measure them. To measure anything, you must have some sort of measuring device. In instrumentation, the measuring device is called a sensing device, or a primary element. With the proper sensing devices, we can measure the four process variables pressure, flow, temperature, and level. Suppose we look first at sensing devices used for measuring pressure. Perhaps the simplest pressure sensing device is the flexible diaphragm. The diaphragm is subjected to different pressures on each side. The difference in pressures causes the diaphragm to move. Any movement of the diaphragm causes a movement of the linkage and a change in the pointer position. A bellows may also be used as a pressure sensing device. This device operates on the principle that any difference in pressure between the inside and outside of the bellows results in a movement which is relayed to the attached pointer. Thus an increase in internal pressure will expand the bellows causing the pointer to move down on the scale. Or a decrease in internal pressure will cause the bellows to contract and the pointer to move up the scale to indicate a lower pressure. This cutaway shows the internal arrangement of parts in a bellows pressure measuring instrument. Because of its simplicity and reliability, the bellows is one of the most frequently used pressure sensing devices in instrument systems. A bellows is the pressure sensing device in the differential pressure transmitter or DP cell. The DP cell not only measures a pressure difference or delta P but can also transmit this pressure to another location. The DP cell will be covered more fully when we discuss transmitters. Another widely used pressure sensing device is the Borden tube. As you can see, it is a C-shaped, flattened tube. The inside of the tube is connected by piping to the source of pressure to be measured. As the pressure inside the tube increases, the tube will tend to straighten out. This results in a movement at the end of the tube, which is connected by mechanical linkage to a shaft on which a pointer is attached. This particular Borden tube can be used for pressures up to 1,000 pounds per square inch. Operating pressures should not exceed the pressure shown on the face of the gauge. Pressure gauges are used for a variety of pressures, ranging from thousands of pounds per square inch to essentially a full vacuum. In operations where changes in pressure are small, the Borden tube may not be sensitive enough. In such cases, a spiral tube may be used to increase movement at the end of the tube. As you can see, a spiral is a long Borden tube wound into concentric loops. Or the Borden tube may be formed in a helix. As in the spiral, sensitivity is increased. With these elements, the range of travel for the end of the tube for a given pressure change 
is approximately proportional to the number of turns that there are in the loop. Now open your workbook to exercise number one. Now suppose we look at sensing devices used for measuring rate of flow. Suppose we wanted to measure the rate of flow through a pipe. The simplest and most widely used measuring device is an orifice. But what is an orifice plate? A typical orifice plate is a flat metal plate about an eighth of an inch thick. It has a precision sized opening in the center through which the fluid to be measured passes. The handle or tab facilitates handling. Information about the orifice plate may be stamped on the tab or a tag attached to it. The orifice is inserted between two flanges in the line. Since the orifice opening is smaller than the pipe, a pressure drop, or delta P, occurs across the orifice. The higher the pressure drop, the larger the flow. It is the pressure drop, or delta P, that is actually measured, but the flow can then be calculated. Since the orifice opening is smaller than the pipe, the velocity through the orifice is higher. Remember, in the module on fluid flow, we talked about pressure energy and velocity energy as being interchangeable. We said that a Venturi tube could be used to show this interchange. The velocity is highest through the smallest part of the tube, and at this point the pressure is lowest. Liquid levels in the two vertical tubes indicate this to be so. An increase in velocity energy has resulted in a decrease in pressure energy. As the velocity goes up, pressure goes down. This same principle applies when an orifice plate is used. You can see the change in pressure pattern through the orifice. P1, just ahead of the orifice, is the highest pressure, and P2, just beyond the orifice, is the lowest pressure. The pressure is lowest where the velocity is highest. To measure the pressure drop across the orifice, we could install a mercury manometer, which is a U-shaped tube filled with mercury. If we connect it to points P1 and P2, you can see that the higher pressure at point P1 forces the mercury upward toward the lower pressure, point P2. The difference in levels is the differential pressure and represents the pressure drop, or delta P, across the orifice for a particular flow rate. If the flow rate is increased, the pressure drop, or delta P, across the orifice will increase. Decreasing the flow rate decreases the delta P across the orifice. Now let's see how we can use these principles to measure rate of flow. Since the liquid level at points P1 and P2 represent the pressures at those points, we can determine the difference in pressure, or delta P, by subtracting the level at P2 from the level at P1. This will give us inches of liquid, which can be converted into pounds per square inch of pressure drop. However, it would be much simpler to use a mercury manometer and read directly the differential pressure in inches of mercury. Suppose the manometer reading was five inches of mercury. Then the pressure drop or delta P across the orifice would be five inches of mercury, or about 2.46 pounds per square inch. Knowing the size of the orifice plate and the physical characteristics of the flowing stream, the flow rate could be calculated for this particular pressure drop. But what would happen if we replaced the orifice plate with one having a larger hole in it? For the same flow rate, the delta P would be less, so we would be able to increase the flow rate 
without exceeding the range of the manometer. We could also change the size of the manometer if we wanted to measure an increased flow. Suppose we had a 5 inch mercury manometer. The maximum flow rate that could be measured would be the rate where the pressure drop across the orifice was 5 inches of mercury. Any higher rate could not be measured using this manometer. However, suppose we replaced the 5 inch manometer with one that would measure a delta P of 10 inches of mercury. The flow rate can now be increased to where the delta P approaches the maximum range of the larger manometer. For a particular orifice installation, we change the range of measurement by changing the range of the measuring devices, in this case, the manometer. When we talk about changing the range tube of an instrument, we will mean changing the measuring device. While we will be dealing with devices other than manometers, the principle is the same, so it should be easier for you to understand. Now for every particular orifice installation, the rate of flow can be calculated for any pressure drop or delta P measured by the meter. In the module on fluid flow, you learned that the rate of flow was proportional to the square root of the delta P. Expressed in mathematical terms, the flow rate equals a constant multiplied by the square root of the pressure drop or delta P. W is the flow rate and F is the constant. The constant F can be determined for an orifice installation and is called a meter constant. The flow rate is readily calculated by multiplying the constant and the square root of the measured delta P. However, taking the square root of every measured delta P is time consuming and tedious. The calculation is easier to do if the meter scale is constructed in such a way as to read the square root directly. This square root chart reads the square root of the delta P directly for a range of, say, 100 inches of water. The number read on the chart is called a pen reading, and we will designate it by the letter L. Now our equation for calculating the flow rate W looks like this. W equals the constant F multiplied by the pen reading L. Let's see how it works. This flow meter has a pen reading of 7.1. The meter constant is 10.2 barrels per day. Using our formula, W, the flow rate, equals F, the meter constant, times L, the pen reading. The flow rate is 72.42 barrels per day. How the meter constant F is calculated will determine if the flow rate units are barrels per day, gallons per minute, etc. Also, if the meter range is different from 100 inches of water, this fact can be accounted for in calculating the meter constant. Now open your workbook to exercise number two. Another device for measuring flow is the venturi. Like the orifice, the venturi causes a pressure drop, which can then be measured and used to calculate flow rate. The venturi is generally more accurate than the orifice. However, it is not as widely used because it is much more expensive than the orifice plate installation. The rotometer is another device for measuring flow. One type is a tapered glass or metal tube with a heavy float inside. The rotometer works on the principle of constant pressure drop being maintained across the float by varying the annular open area between the float and the tube wall. For example, an increase in flow rate causes the float to rise, and as it rises, 
the annular area between the float and the tube wall increases. The float will rise until the annular area has increased to compensate for the increase in flow rate. The position of the float is used in determining the flow rate. To determine the flow, you multiply the indicated float position by the provided meter constant. Now suppose we look at another device for measuring flow, positive displacement meters. Positive displacement meters are used where very accurate flow measurement is required. As the name implies, the positive displacement meter is a meter in which a specific quantity of liquid is displaced with each revolution. There are many different designs of these meters, but they all work on the basis of each displacement causing an indicator to register the displacement. You can see the indicating counter on top of this meter. It may read directly in barrels, gallons, or some other unit of volume measurement. Another type of positive displacement meter is the sliding vane meter. Here you see a fixed eccentric cam in red that causes projecting vanes to move and create compartments called measuring chambers between the rotor and the case. With each revolution, the total flow over a period of time is registered by a mechanical counter. As the rotor turns, you can see the liquid in the highlighted compartment is being moved toward the meter outlet. Vane B is moving back from the casing wall to permit the liquid to flow out. Here you see vane B has passed the outlet, and as vane A moves forward, the liquid is forced out of the compartment. One RPM would mean the displacing of the liquid in all four compartments. Another type of positive displacement meter is the lobe type meter. With this type meter, the rotating lobes force out a specific volume of liquid with each rotation. As with the sliding vane meter, an indicator registers each displacement. Now open your workbook to exercise number three.